at Easter, but I know. But uh, I hope everybody feels uh, welcome this morning. Did everybody enjoy the meal? Yeah. That was pretty awesome, wasn't it? Terry did a great job with all the guys come together and fixed a great breakfast this morning. I hope you mothers felt special this morning. And I'm glad y'all are all here this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we will observe uh, baptism this morning. Exciting day, exciting day. Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. We thank you, Lord, that we have the awesome privilege to be able to come into your house. So many people around the world, Lord, today are having to do service in hiding because of fear of uh, persecution. But Lord, here still in America, we're able to come in to the house of God and to be able to worship you. And so we praise you for that. Help us never to take that for granted. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for all the mamas here today. Thank you, Lord, that uh, uh, each of these mothers are special to uh, Eastside, special to uh, um, boys and girls and, and others here as well, Lord. We thank you for them. I pray you'll bless them, give them a good day today. Uh, Lord, I pray you'll be with us uh, here during the service. I pray you'll speak through Pastor here in a little bit. You'll uh, sing uh, beautifully through the choir. Uh, what you want uh, uh, us to hear this morning. Uh, I pray, Father, as this baptism goes down this morning, I pray, Father, you will just be with each one. And, Lord, may it be an encouragement and a challenge to each one of us. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we have the privilege of beginning our service with the ordinance of baptism. We refer to it as an ordinance, not a sacrament, because it does not save us. Rather, we do it because Christ ordained it. He ordered it. And it is a picture of our recognition or our identification with Christ. We are saying that we have died, been buried, and will be raised, raised again with Him. We are saying that we have died to our old life. We are resurrected to a new life. And it is our public profession of faith in Jesus Christ. You join us as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy and kindness, and we thank you for adding daily to the church those who are being saved. We ask, Lord, that you would just uh, be with these who are uh, about to make their public profession of faith, and Lord, that you would use them mightily for the kingdom of God, and Heavenly Father, that you would just cause the, uh, these uh, individuals to walk with you daily, to grow with you daily, and that, Lord, that uh, they would... This would be the very beginning of a lifelong walk with you in Christ's name. Amen. Hunter. Hunter has come this morning upon his profession of faith in Jesus Christ. Hunter, do you believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, that he lived a perfect life, that he died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins, that he was uh, buried, was raised on the third day, that he ascended to be with the Father, and one day he's returning for his church? Do you believe these things? I do. In obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Savannah, do you believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, that he lived a perfect life, that he died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, that he ascended to be with the Father, and one day he's returning for his church? See, I do. Then in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I baptize you, Savannah Bruce, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Thank you. 
Gracie Fryer has come upon her profession of faith in Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. Gracie, you do believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, that He lived a perfect life, that He died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins, that He was buried and raised on the third day, that He ascended to be with the Father, and one day He's returning for His church. Do you believe these things? I do. Then in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Do you believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, that he lived a perfect life, that he died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins? That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, that he ascended to the right hand of the Father, and one day he's returning for his church. Do you believe these things? Yes, sir. Then in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, my sister Kara Holler. Emily Thomas has come this morning upon her profession of faith in Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. Emily, do you believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin? That he lived a perfect life, that he died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins. That he was buried, that he was raised again on the third day, that he ascended to be with the Father, and one day he's returning for his church. Do you believe these things? Yeah. That in the obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. The Bible teaches that it is not the pastor that baptizes, but it is the church. And so as a church, we need to commit ourselves to help these new believers grow and mature as uh, mature functioning believers in Christ. So let's join our, our hearts together, pray and ask the Lord as we make this commitment to be examples of the faith to these new believers. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the fact that you have added these believers to our church. We ask, Lord, that you would help us now as we attempt to be good examples of what a Christian should be. Help us, Lord, to be able to say to them, follow us even as we follow Christ. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to do all that is in our power to help them grow and mature and become functioning followers of Christ. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. There it is. I ask you to stand with us as we sing this morning our first song, 10,000 Reasons. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul. I'll worship your, your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing with me. Comes. Bless 
And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years, then forevermore. Bless the Lord.
It's certainly good to be here this morning. The church is full. Just a beautiful sight. A beautiful day to honor our mothers. Let us pray. I ask before we uh, start our prayer, if anyone would like to come to the altar, please feel free to do so at this time. Let's pray. Father, we just want to praise you and thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of life that you bestow upon us in such great abundance. We thank you, Father, for this special day that we have that we can come and honor our moms. And we thank you for what their influence has been in our lives. And, Lord, as we see our, our kids grow up and our grandkids grow up and we understand the influence, is un, it's insurmountable, Father. It cannot even be um, limited to what moms do in the families. Father, help us to understand that and help us to certainly not just honor them today, but every day that you allow us to live. Father, we want to praise you and thank you for the, um, the service we had this morning and the uh, gym. We thank you for the, all the people that came, the food. We just thank you for that goodness that you give us to us. And Lord, now in the baptisms, what a special blessing it is to see these young people go through the ordinance of baptism. Father, we pray that as a church you would help us to understand the gravity of that and help us to be uh, influences and leaders in their lives, Father, that we may show them um, the Christ-like way to walk and to talk. And Father, help our church to ever understand the, the uh, responsibilities that we have as a church to these young people. And then, Father, we ask that you would bless our pastor as he comes. We pray that you would anoint and use him mightily. We thank you for him and his ministry. We pray that the Holy Spirit may touch each of our hearts and may the Word of God be, be sealed, Lord, and maybe we, may we take it and take it outside the walls of this church and, Father, live it in our communities and may we be Christ-like in our actions, our deeds, and our thinking. And then, Father, we pray that you would um, bless in a special way in all the things that are going on in our church body. There's a lot of sicknesses. There's uh, surgeries that are coming. We know that uh, there's many things that, that we just need a special help from you on, and we ask, God, that you would just bless and, and do that, Father, that only you can do in each of these lives. Again, we want to praise you and thank you for the precious blood that was shed on Calvary's cross. It makes everything that we've done this morning possible, it makes eternal life possible, it makes the Christian life possible, and we thank you, Lord. Your gift to us can never be matched, and we need to be humble and submissive before you and thank you every day for it. Father, now we ask for guidance and direction. We pray for a special anointing again, and we just uh, we'll bow before you in, in humbleness and give you praise and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, that is always a great way to start a service with uh, baptism. And uh, we're so glad you're here with us today. Now, we are honoring mothers, but as part of our Mother's Day celebration, we also do our baby dedication, which uh, properly known is actually parent-child dedication because it is the parents who are making a commitment to raise their child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So I want to ask uh, Aaron and Laura, uh, would they come up and bring Adeline with them? She is happy. Yes, you are. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is Adeline Locke. Did I say it right, Adeline? Yeah. Okay, Adeline Golock. And, of course, parents, uh, Laura and Aaron. And uh, grandparents are Victor and Maria Rodriguez. And uh, Tim and uh, Tamara Golock. Sir? Uh, Jim. I said Jim, didn't I? Said I said Tim. Tim. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm fond of the name Tim for some reason. <laughs> Jim and Tamara. Okay, uh, and uh, this morning uh, we, we are uh, going to uh, do a parent-child dedication. Uh, let me begin by presenting Alan with a little New Testament. All right. Also, I want to present her with a letter, and that letter is a letter from me to her, and it's to be open to the day that she, she uh, follows the Lord and believers' baptism. Now, uh, I'm going to read a little responsive reading, and uh, you'll just respond by saying we do. Also, congregation, you have a portion in this, so if you respond by saying we will. The child you present this morning today is a gift from your Heavenly Father, a divine trust. From the foundation of the world, God has ordained that this child will be entrusted to your care in your home. 
Parents, do you recognize that this child is a blessing from God? If so, say, we do. Scripture commands you as parents to teach your child about the Lord Jesus Christ. Only then will she be adequately equipped for the challenges of this life and sufficiently prepared to meet the Lord when He returns. But your, ch your child's spiritual welfare will not be accomplished simply by telling her about Jesus. It is the words of your mouth combined with the example that will, that your example that will effectively communicate the message of God's love and saving power to your child. The birth of this child needs to inspire within the both of you a greater resolve to let Christ shine through you by being even more intentional in your pursuit of holiness and Christ's likeness in your home. Do you accept this responsibility? We do. As a church, we are all part of the family of God. And as a family, we need to work alongside these parents in their efforts to lead their uh, child to Christ. Will we rise to the challenge of being what... Uh, being brothers and sisters in Christ and exhibit godly character and thus provide continuity between what is being taught at home and what is being seen at church. Congregation, if you will make this commitment, will you respond by saying, we will. As a church family, we must also be willing to hold, uh, hold uh, and render whatever aid, advice, and assistance we can to help these parents raise their child to know Christ. You have heard these parents state their commitment to a greater level of Christ-likeness for the sake of their child. Will you now acknowledge their commitment and indicate your willingness to help them keep their promise in any way which you are able? If so, will you respond by saying, we will. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Adeline. We thank you for the trust that she represents. We thank you, Lord, for... Uh, the opportunity to raise this child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We pray that she would become a follower of Christ when the time comes. We claim her for the kingdom of God. We ask, Lord, that you work mightily in her life. And, Lord, that you would protect her, that you would provide for her, that you would give her health and safety, but more than that, that you would give her eternal life. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. We want to continue to honor our mothers this morning, so I'm going to ask the, the kids to come forward. We have a little presentation for our mothers. So if our kids would come forward, right over here. All right. Okay. Now. Everybody turn around and face the other direction. All right. That's good. No, I'm, I'm going to do this, Noah, not you, brother. All right. <laughs> all right. I want all our moms to stand. If you're a mother or grandmother and you're here this morning, whether your kids are here or not, would you stand? Okay. Okay. We want to present a flower to each one of our mothers, each one of the moms. So if you'll take one and take a couple of them, give one first to your mom and then give one to another mom, okay? Oops, let's get along, that one's broken. Yeah, get a couple. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Take a couple of those. So. Give first to your mom, and then find another mom, if you can. There you go. Here you go, sweetie. Yeah. All right. Oh, oh, don't give you another one here. You already done one, no, haven't you? No, we're gonna we're gonna hand them. Okay. Right. Just the ones that are here. Okay. You can have a seat, Eddie. You can give her this one. How about this? There. Give that. that to you, Mom. Okay. Do that. There you go. That's awesome. Okay. All right. Moms, once you get a flower, would you sit down and then the kids will be able to find the ones that still have it? Okay. Okay. Oh my goodness. It's not a flower. I 
that's okay. One per mom. Oops. All right, all right, you got one to give. Go get that one. Okay. That's fine. Okay. That should do it. That's it. You can have a seat. Oh, there's one right there. Pick it up. All right. You can have a seat. That's all I have a seat. That's fine. Okay. Got some that are broken? Yep. Alright, that's alright. Okay. Okay. Right. Oops, that one's broken, but we'll get it. Here you go. Give that to her mom. Alright. Give that to her mom. To mom. That's all. Right, Jeff, see. That's all. Okay. Over here in the back corner. In the back corner, Noah. <laughs> Okay. Let's have a prayer and give thanks for mothers this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and grace and the fact that you have blessed us with so many wonderful blessings. We have food and clothing and shelter. We have the privilege of worship. We also have the, the privilege of uh, gathering together with, with uh, friends and family to worship you. Lord, we also thank you for the wonderful grace gift of mothers this morning. Lord, we know that their, their uh, work is never done. We know, Lord, that uh, often it is difficult. But, Lord, it's also a rewarding job. And, Lord, we ask that you would strengthen and empower our mothers, that you would give them wisdom and direction and guidance, even as we give you glory and praise for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Number 397.
Wow, that was beautiful. If you have your Bibles, let's turn this morning to Proverbs, the Old Testament book of Proverbs. It's almost at the center of your Bible. If you look for Proverbs, you put your fingers in the middle and open in the center, and you'll probably come, you should come to uh, Psalms or Proverbs. I came to Ezekiel when I did mine, but I'm not sure if that's right. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 1, beginning in verse 7 this morning. The book of Proverbs is uh, written uh, by, mostly by King Solomon, and uh, there are a few others that are included in the book of Proverbs, but mostly by King Solomon. Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived, not a perfect man by any stretch of the imagination, but a very wise individual, and he gives us a number of statements, uh, he gives us a, a large number of statements that are truisms things that uh, stand true, very, very practical. It's one of the most practical books in the entire Bible. But uh, this morning we're going to see that it also is a book that lifts up and glorifies Christ. Proverbs chapter 1, beginning in verse 7 this morning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother. For they will be a graceful ornament on your neck, on your neck, on your head, and chains about your neck. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy, inspired, and inerrant word. We thank you for the truths that are contained therein. We ask, Lord, that you would move in power in this congregation. Apply your word. We ask, Lord, that you would do great and mighty things in our lives according to it, and that you would be lifted up and glorified through it. We thank you, Lord, that the the grass fades, the flowers uh, wilt, but Lord, uh, your word endures forever. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. As I said, the book of Proverbs is a book of Solomon. It actually begins the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. He was a great king. He was the son of a king. He was one of the richest and wisest men who have ever lived. When people came into Solomon's uh, presence, they bowed before him, they knelt before him. He was a mighty king, he was a man of great authority, he was a man that people feared, but even great kings should bow to their mothers. In uh, the scriptures, in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 19, we see that Solomon's mother comes to visit him. Her name was Bathsheba. She had married uh, his father under some very ugly circumstances, things were very displeasing to God, but she was still his mother. And in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 19, she comes to speak to Solomon. King Solomon, it says, Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him for Adonijah, and the king arose to meet her, bowed before her, and sat on his throne. Then he had a throne set for the king's mother, and, sat, and she sat on his right hand. When they had their conversation, first of all, this great king, this man who is incredibly wealthy, a man of great wisdom, a man of great power, when his mother enters the room, he bows before her. And when they sit to have a conversation, he has a throne brought and seated next to, her, to him so that she sits on a throne equal with him while they are talking. Now Solomon was not a, a perfect king. As I said, he is, he is not a perfect man. But God guided his insights and he preserved his, his, uh, uh, his insights, his understanding in the book of Proverbs. And, and he did it for a reason, for us to learn. And one of the things we can learn from Solomon is how to honor your mother. That your mother is worthy of honor. Folks, your mother may not have been a perfect mother. She, she may not be a perfect woman. But if she's your mother, the Bible says that we are to give honor to them. Honor thy father and thy mother, the commandment says, that thy days may be long upon the earth. They deserve our honor. And in Proverbs chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, we're going to look at six things that relate to, to uh, the family and to motherhood. And I want us to note as we look at this that the wisdom that Solomon gives us is a little different from the worldly wisdom that we pick up. This is not the same kind of thing that you would pick up reading Parents Magazine or listening to Dr. Phil. Some of what he says overlaps with the wisdom of the world. But the thing that is different, that, that stands out in Solomon's Proverbs, is that uh, Solomon's Proverbs 
always, always bring God into the equation. Now, the problem with worldly family advice, the fatal flaw with worldly family advice, is that it always leaves God out. It never considers God in the, in the equation. But Solomon's counsel is always related to God. In, in fact, much of what he gives us, much of what he says to us, is so that God will be glorified and lifted up in our lives, so that God will be honored. Solomon's wisdom is not just so that you can live a profitable life and an easy life or uh, live a long life. His wisdom is so that you can bring honor and glory to God. It's always God-centered, and that's what's really important. If we're going to live lives that, that please God, they must be God-centered lives. And everything Solomon tells us is God-centered. I'll give you an example in Proverbs 30, verse 8. He says, Give me neither poverty nor riches, Feed me with the food that is my portion, lest I be full and deny thee, and say, Who is the Lord, or lest I be in want and steal and profane the name of God. See, Solomon didn't say that just so that uh, you would live a, a comfortable life or a happy life. He says, listen, you need to pray that you will neither be poor nor wealthy because you want to make sure that you honor God. And if you're wealthy, you might forget God. If you're poor, you might displease God or dishonor Him by stealing. So... Everything Solomon says always relates to God and how we are going to bring glory and honor to Him. So let's look at these six lessons in Proverbs chapter 1 that relate to God and yet are still very practical when it comes to the family this morning. The first thing I want us to know as we look at this scripture is that Solomon assumes, he assumes that the family started with God. The family was God's idea. Solomon takes it for granted that mothers and fathers and children are going to be in a relationship with a unique sense of accountability to one another. In verse 8, he says, My son, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother. Now, this is just a given with Solomon that God has established the family and that you are going to live as mother and father with Children. Now, that can't be taken for granted anymore. The family has been torn apart. It has been shaken up. One observer observed that it seems that the nuclear family has exploded in our country today. Uh, the, the family is being uh, disparaged. It's falling apart all around us. Uh, one of the, the things that we see when we, we look across the country is that people are, are saying that the family is just... Uh, the result of social and cultural traditions, that the family is, is based on evolutionary development, based on our instincts. Those are not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches God created the family. The family is important to God. Did you know the family is the very first institution God created? God did not start by creating government. God did not start by creating the school. God started by creating the family, by putting a man and a woman in the garden and telling them to be fruitful and multiply. The very first institution God created was the family, and it is God who created it and God who ordained, who designed the relationships that would exist within the family. God tells Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 2, 24, uh, verse 24, that they were to uh, be fruitful. They were to fill the earth. Now, how were they to do this? Well, they do this through just casual sexual relationships. You know, in, in our society today, marriage is, is almost disappearing. When my daughter got married, um, she had a lot of friends and people she worked with that came to her and found out she was getting married, and they asked, why are you getting married? And she said, well, because I love, love my husband, my, my fiancé. And I said, well, why are you getting married? Are you pregnant? And, and unfortunately, that, that seems to be the mentality today. Marriage is optional. Marriage is optional. God created the family to be the context in which we would fulfill that command of being fruitful and multiplying and filling and subduing the earth. That is the context in which it was created. So man and wife, living in a one-flesh relationship, 
not only physically, but in regard to their goals and their objectives and their mindset, living as, as one unit. God designed the covenant relationship between one man and one woman, cleaving to each one alone in this one flesh union. And in that rare occasion when, when uh, death or divorce would, uh, would take one of the, the uh, members away uh, and create a single parent family, God still is gracious and merciful in helping millions of people, especially women out there who are, are single moms, to raise their children alone. But it is God's original purpose. The heart of the family is to be one man, one woman, cleaving together as husband and wife, becoming one flesh, both physically and in purpose and in goals. And we are meant to subdue and fill the earth and create children that will bear in the image of God and reflect His glory. The family is God's idea, and it was created for His glory. Solomon assumes that here. Secondly, if you look at the Scripture, the family is intended to be a school. It's intended to be a place of instruction. Verse 8, My son, hear the instruction of your father, and do not forsake the law of your mother. The father is an instructor. The mother is a teacher. Therefore, the family is a school. It's a school. See, God ordained that the family not just be fruitful and fill the earth with people, but to fill it with certain kinds of people, people who had been instructed, who came, who were instructed in the knowledge of the Lord. The family's a place where the next generation is not only born, but taught how to live. See, life doesn't come naturally for human beings. Um, the, we have certain reflexes, reflexes, certain instincts when we're born, the instinct to nurse, the instinct that when you're falling to, to catch yourself, those are instincts. But everything else pretty much has to be learned. We have to learn about God. We have to learn certain skills. We have to learn how to walk on two legs. We have to learn how to speak we have to learn how to eat. We have to learn how to show courtesy and gratitude and respect. And we have to learn about faith in Jesus Christ. These are the things that we are taught within the context of the family. The family is God's school for this undertaking of teaching the next generation how to live in the world and how to be ready for the next. If a mother and father seek help in raising their children from from grandparents, or from the daycare, or from the school, or from the church, or from anybody else, that's fine. But ultimately, the responsibility for teaching your children falls to the parents, to mom and to dad. They are responsible. And they're also responsible for what these other people are teaching their children, and making sure that they're being taught the right thing. Parents are meant to be the primary teachers. And so we must be careful about what our children are being taught, how they are being molded, what they're, what they're seeing, what their caregivers are teaching them. So the second point is that the family is God's basic school for instructing children how to live. The third thing we see in this passage is that the foundation of family instruction is the fear of the Lord. The, the, base, the, the base of all this, the thing that undergirds it all, is the fear of God. The fear of God, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. In, in other words, if we ask what is the theme of mom and dad's instruction, it should always be the fear of the Lord. What you're teaching them, what you're modeling for them, should be the respect, the fear of the Lord. And when I talk about the fear of the Lord, people say, well, am I supposed to live in terror of God? Well, you're spent, meant to live in awe of God. You're meant to reverence Him. He is all-powerful. Consider the power of God, the, the one who has created the whole universe, the one who spoke the earth into existence, who set the planets in their orbits around the sun, who created the galaxies, this almighty, all-powerful God rules the whole universe. And we should live in awe of Him. 
We should live in reverence of Him. That's what it means when, when it says that we are to fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge. It's the foundation of all knowledge. So when we teach our children, it should all be undergirded by one big idea. God is in charge. God is all-powerful. God is behind everything. Everything that you receive comes by the grace of God. God is the foundation of everything. The family isn't just a place where children learn how to hold spoons and walk on two feet and say, please tie their shoes, look both ways before you cross the street. The family is where all of the things we teach them, all things we teach them are undergirded by the, by the Word of God and the glory of God. The fear of God, learning to reverence God, standing in awe of God, learning to trust God, that's what families are for, to teach that to children. The family's God's idea. The family is God's school. The underlying theme of everything we teach is the fear of God, but fourth, both fathers and mothers share the responsibility for teaching their children. Both fathers and mothers. Mothers and fathers. Uh, verse 8 doesn't say, fathers instruct and mothers change diapers. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say fathers work so they don't have any responsibility for teaching their children. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say when mom has a job outside the home that she doesn't have any responsibility for teaching. The daycare can take over that, or the, the school can take over that, or even the church can take over that. Fathers instruct, mothers teach. They both share that responsibility. Now, if this was Father's Day, I'd probably issue a challenge to fathers to take more responsibility at home. But it's Mother's Day, so I want to encourage mothers that this responsibility to teach your children is really, it is a privilege. It is a profound privilege. See, God has a, a way of bringing down the great and exalting the lowly. One of the problems we have in our country is that for years, the idea of, of motherhood was disparaged. It kind of fell out of, out of uh, fashion to be a mom. Um, there, even today, you'll see people who, who uh, will disparage the idea of motherhood and uh, lift up the idea of a woman having a career, and there's nothing wrong with, with having a career. But folks, there is no job, no job, that is more important than being a mom. There is no job you will ever have that is more important than being a mom. I told our breakfast this morning, someone uh, asked Napoleon uh, Bonaparte one time, said, uh, what, what does France need more, in, more than anything else? He said, they need good moms. We need good moms. America needs good mothers. There is no job in the world that is more important than being a mom. Now, I think, although in the past it's kind of been disparaged, I think motherhood's kind of on an upswing now. You hear more and more about moms who have chosen to be stay-at-home moms and, and more how that's being looked on as, a, as an honorable thing to do. It's a great thing to do. It really is. Um, I was reading this week, according to salary.com, the value of the work done by a stay-at-home mom is $113,586. Well, that's pretty respectable, don't you think? One writer at salon.com wrote about how he was on a coffee break at work. He was sitting in the break room, he was sipping coffee, and his wife had, had recently had a child, and one of his coworkers happened to be a woman who came in and said, uh, you know, how's the baby? And he said, doing great, doing great. He said, well, is your wife going back to work soon? And he said, well, actually, she's going to be a stay-at-home mom. And the response was, oh, fun. <laughs> and he said, well, not always. <laughs> not always fun. And she said, well, you know, it's not like she's working. And he said, no, it's not like she's working, because, you know, you and I are sitting here having a nice coffee break in the break room. She never gets a break. <laughs> So she'd probably love to have a break like this. And he said the conversation kind of went downhill from there. We need to honor motherhood. Being a mom is the greatest thing you can do. Being a mother is the most important job you will ever have. And God honors it. God honors it. There's nothing that is more important than being a mom. And 
2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. The Apostle Paul talks about the faith, the, the legacy of faith that Timothy received and how important it is. He says, I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. In chapter 3, verses 14 and 15 of, of 2 Timothy, Paul says, You, however, continue with the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Moms, dads, you can go out and do all kinds of jobs. You can do all kinds of work. Folks, you can, you can be the, the chief executive officer of a multinational corporation. You can be a person who, who brings in a uh, you know, six or seven figure salary. You can be president of the United States. But none of that, none of that is any more important than teaching your child so that they come to know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior and have heaven and eternal life. Nothing is more important than the instruction of a mom and of a dad. Nothing is more important than that. Timothy had a remarkable testimony. His father was a Greek and probably an unbeliever. So it fell to his mother and his grandmother to teach him about the faith, to teach him about Christianity and about salvation. And Timothy, Timothy will live forever in heaven because his mother and his grandmother did not forsake that responsibility of passing on their faith to the next generation. It is, it is a, a constant, constant, uh, 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 I started to say worry, but you know, just disconcerting to me that we seem to be losing the next generation in this country. We, we are not passing on the faith to the next generation. Folks, we, we, we teeter on the brink of a new dark ages in this country because we're not passing on the faith and our values and our morals like we've always had before. There's nothing you can do as a mom or a dad that's more important than teaching your kids about Christ. Motherhood is the most important job there is. Fifth, God demands that children be submissive to parents. Verse 8. My son, hear the instruction of your mother and do not forsake the law of your uh, hear the instruction of your father, do not forsake the law of your mother. These two commands warn against the the common temptation amongst kids to rebel. We've all heard the old saying, you know, my my father was was the dumbest person I ever knew when I was 15 years old. But by the time I was 21, he was the smartest man I ever knew. It was amazing how much he learned in that six years. It, now it's, it's true, though. Kids have this temptation to, to rebel against their parents and what their parents have taught them. Solomon says here, hear your father's instruction. If you're at home, listen to what your father is teaching you. Listen to him. He's not half as dumb as you think he is. And in about 10 or 15 years, you'll finally recognize it. Listen to what your father is teaching you. And when you are away from home, when you have left home and you are traveling, you're out in the world, do not forsake what your mother taught you. Don't leave it. Don't abandon what she has taught you. Young people, listen to what the scriptures tell you. The Ten Commandments tell us in Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, Honor your father and mother. Why? That your days might be long upon the earth. If you listen to your parents, you will not make a lot of the mistakes that people are making today. You'll have, a, you'll have not only an easier life, but you'll have a much better opportunity to have a longer life. If you'll listen to what mom and dad have taught you, honor them. Honor them. You know, just kind of an aside here. Why is it that God put in the Ten Commandments. Now, the Ten Commandments, the, the summary of the whole law, why does he put in there, honor your father and mother? Well, why do you put that in there? You know why? Because it's the foundation of all authority. 
If a child does not learn to honor their father and their mother, then ultimately they will not honor anyone else in society. They won't honor that boss that hires them. They won't honor their teachers in school. They won't honor law enforcement. They won't honor the laws of the government. And ultimately, ultimately, they won't honor God himself. They won't know Christ as their Savior. Folks, it is important to teach our children to honor their parents, to be subject to their parents. Finally this morning, he gives a promise of reward. God provides a reward for sons and daughters who do not forsake the teaching of their mother and father. Verse 9. For they will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. This is a picture of an Olympic champion here. When an Olympic contestant won, they would put a, a laurel crown on his head. And they would often give him a chain with a pendant on it that showed that he was an Olympic champion. And what he's saying here is that, that uh, the, the teaching of your mother and father, these, these things will lead to triumph and joy and celebration in your life. You want to be a champion? Listen to your parents. Honor your parents. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 2, Honor your father and mother. It is the first commandment with promise. All the commandments are full of promise, but God gives out a special promise to those who listen to their mothers and fathers. Listen to the promises he gives us. Proverbs 14, verse 26. In the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Honor your parents. Honor your parents. And you will have confidence and a fountain of life. The fear of the Lord leads to life so that one may sleep satisfied, untouched by evil. Proverbs 19, verse 23. This is a wreath on your head and an ornament on your neck, a fountain of life, a fountain of confidence, a fountain of satisfaction. Fear the Lord. Honor your parents, submit to their authority, which comes from God, by the way. But since it's Mother's Day, perhaps the way we should end this is by reminding ourselves as sons and daughters, whether we're old or young, that the fountain of life, the strong confidence, the deep satisfaction that comes from honoring all the truth that our mothers and our fathers have taught us comes back to, to them as a crown of joy and honor and blessing in their later years as well. I talk to parents and grandparents all the time. Uh, it's no accident that when you go and talk to a grandparent, they're always going to bring up their grandchildren. It's no accident. It's no accident. You are their joy. Kids, you are your parents' pride and joy. Do not give them, do not give them cause for sadness. Don't grieve them. Honor them. Honor them. Proverbs 23, 22. Do not despise your mother when she is old. Proverbs 23, verse 25. Let your father and your mother be glad and let them rejoice who gave birth to you. Your know, moms and dads, none of us are, are perfect. I'm a, I'm a dad. I raised two daughters. Uh, they're, they're both grown now and uh, they're both doing well. And let me tell you, there's nothing harder than the job of being a parent. Just, you know, it's just us here today. I'm just going to be, be honest with you. I made a lot of mistakes. I was not a perfect parent. I always heard the story about the, the young preacher. He was in his 20s, and he had a sermon that he liked to preach. And ten, and it was entitled, Ten Principles for Guaranteeing That Your Children Will Turn Out Perfect. He loved that sermon. And then he became a parent. A couple of years later, the sermon changed into two or three things you may or may not want to try. <laughs> Being a parent is really, really hard. And you need all the resources, all the help you can get. And the greatest resource you can have is Jesus Christ, who will empower you and strengthen you and give you wisdom and guidance when you need it, patience when you need it, if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your Savior, Mother's Day is a great day 
to come to Christ. Any day is a great day to come to Christ, but especially on Mother's Day. Maybe you're here this morning with your mom. What would make her happier than to know that she'll be with you in heaven? Maybe you're here this morning, you're raising small children. You need God's help to raise those kids. You need his help. The Bible says we're all sinners. We've all come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, separation from God for eternity in a place called hell. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. The Bible says that if we will confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's told us that our God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. He will forgive your sins and he will give you everlasting life. Today can be a new start for you. It can be a day of becoming a better parent and having heaven and eternal life. If you would like to know Christ, your personal Savior, we're going to sing a hymn in just a moment. I'll be down here at the front. I'm going to invite you to step out in the aisle, come to the front and say, Pastor, I want to know this Jesus you've been talking about. I need help to be a parent. I, I, I believe today that Jesus died for my sins. I want to receive the gift of, free, of eternal life he offers me. I want to receive that. I want to know that I have heaven and eternal life. I want to know 100%, and you can. The Bible says these things are written that you might know. You can know. You can know today. Let's be obedient to God's call in our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us mothers. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us instruction and wisdom and guidance, that you have placed us within the context of families. Lord, we thank you for all these grace gifts. We thank you most of all for the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, if there's any here that does not know Christ, that you would draw them to salvation this very morning. We pray, Lord, that you move in power in our, our uh, congregation this morning. Convict those who don't know Christ of their sin and their need for a Savior. And for those of us who are parents, we ask, Lord, that you would convict us how we need to be better teachers, better examples. For those of us who are sons and daughters, convict us, Lord, of how we need to honor our parents. Lord, we thank you for your...